Welcome back. Uh, I'm Dr. Brian Peterson, and we're going to start in Chapter 8 today. We are working through uh, my book, The Bible, Sexuality, and Culture. I pray that you've been being blessed by the reading, but also uh, prepared and being able to uh, work through this material and learn how to respond in our change, quickly changing culture. And so today's class, we're going to continue on with the mandate of family and procreation, and we're going to look at Part 3, uh, dealing with procreation, but particularly with abortion in the Bible. Last time we looked at abortion at abortion and culture and how we got uh, to where we are culturally. And in today's lesson, lesson in chapter 8, I want to look at what the Bible has to say about this. Now, I, I will point out right up front that there is a growing number of individual scholars who are actually saying, and, and remember, these are self-professing Christians, who are saying that the Bible is either silent on abortion or in some way supports it. And I've actually known people myself who have said this type of thing. And this is coming from both evangelicals and mainline scholars. It's not coming from the far left. It is coming from both sides of the church. Uh, others insist, you know, actually that the scriptural arguments against abortion are actually weak. If, we are, if there's anything there on abortion, they said, it's not strong enough to actually in any way diminish, you know, the laws uh, today on abortion. Well, we're going to examine the text today, and we're going to look at uh, that argument and see if it's true. What does the Bible actually say about it? And what are some of the Christian responses? And, and are there any, is there any way that we can actually apologetically combat those discussions? And so, while uh, there are certainly other issues that are germane to this discussion, and we could have included, or I could have included uh, an entire discussion on child sacrifice, for example, because in essence what we are do dealing with with abortion today is nothing better than child sacrifice, even though I could have spent the whole session just talking about that from an ancient perspective and a biblical perspective, we're going to set that discussion aside. And what I want to do is I want to look specifically at what the Bible has to say about children in the womb. And so um, hopefully you've had a chance to read over the chapter and your facilitators had a chance to as well and prepared. And so let's jump right in. We're going to look at, begin in Genesis, and we're just going to kind of work through some of these texts. Uh, and uh, some are going to be obviously stronger than others, but together, what I often argue is when you pull all these texts together into a bundle, uh, they become stronger, much like the three-strand cord of, Ecc of Ecclesiastes. And so I want to begin by looking at Genesis 1.27. Uh, and this is the fact that humans are obviously made in the image of God. And what does that mean? Obviously, at the very beginning, hum humans were made out of the dirt. And But from this point forward, when humans began to procreate, uh, we carried on the image, obviously, of Adam, but also the image of God. And so the major question that scholars have looked at in this regard is, when does a person gain a soul? If, a, if the soul is not given to a child until they're born, well then the argument is often made that uh, we can kill a child in the womb or a fetus because they're not a person. Uh, or if it's at the age of viability, you know, then anything before that, the child can be aborted. Well, these are the issues that are kind of on the leading uh, or cutting edge of the abortion debate. And again, you can't look at just one passage and say, well, that's the end all. You have to look at the overall tenor of Scripture and how God views uh, the whole concept of children in the womb and how He views procreation. And so, one of the, the in that 127 passage, it's very clear that the image of God plays a central role to this. Now, again, in the book of Genesis, over in 9 6, you see the same thing appearing again where capital punishment is established because of somebody taking the life of another individual. And the reason that God gives for capital punishment is because the image of God is in the person. Now, again, we're going to talk a little bit about what that is and what that means. And so that leads us to that natural question of what is that image and, and what, does it, uh, what does it entail? And scholars are all over the map on this. And, I mean, there have been entire books written on what is called the Imago Dei, the image of God. Some say it's our creative ability. Some say it's our ability to interact, our relational perspectives. Um, Self-awareness. Uh, we have even our physical nature, you know, our physical stature. These are some of the things that have been proposed. And again, there are many that have been listed. Uh, but I think that while all of these are important, there's no question that these are all part of being human. 
you have to be very careful because if you take away, for example, the creativity, if you take away the ability to interact, well, you have people outside of the womb, people with dementia, people who are sick um, and in some way physically or mentally incapable of interacting, does that mean they do not carry the image of God? And these are some of the dangerous uh, issues that we have to address with some of the definitions of the image of God and what that means. And so uh, as I've been looking at it more from the Hebrew perspective, what I have come to is that it's while all these other things are important, really I think what this boils down to is the fact that we have eternal souls. In other words, it's our eternality. We are created in the image of God to live forever. In the same way God is eternal, Man and women were, were created to be eternal. And so therefore, if we uh, snuff out the, uh, the, the terrestrial life, what we are doing is we are actually striking out against the eternality of God. We are trying to end life. And, and that is where I think this plays such a vital role. Now, again, I don't think that any one definition encapsulates it all, but there's definitely that part of it. And so uh, if a baby, for example, is viable, as I've noted in, from 23 to 24 weeks, um, can we abort children after this if, in fact, the, uh, you know, a definition of the image of God doesn't include eternality? And again, this is where we are starting to see the debate kind of boil over into the church realm because I have I've talked to a number of individuals who don't think that children actually, uh, you know, are, have a soul or become a person until they're born. And that is a very scary place to be. And so, as I move on to Genesis 1, 28 and 2, 24, these are all uh, the passages, and there's a lot of these in the genealogies, all dealing with procreation and God's, um, God's central uh, mandate that we are to procreate. Well, if that is his central mandate, and as I noted in my previous chapter, if God has commanded us to be fruitful and multiply and to fill the earth, um, then it really pushes the, the balance of credulity to think that God would be okay for us to kill our children in the womb. Uh, if, in fact, this is the, const the constant refrain that we see in these open chapters, but yet somehow we think it's okay to usurp that. Um, I think that this is, is a major problem within our thinking when we say, uh, that, that God would be okay with it because that goes directly against the mandate of procreation. And then when you move over to Genesis 25, uh, verse 23, and there's a number of these passages, and I list them in the book. Uh, but specifically, we look at the story of Isaac and Rebekah having twins. And those twins are Jacob and Esau. And while they are still in the womb, uh, God makes it very clear to uh, Rebekah that those two children are two nations and that they're warring with one another. And here you have God himself coming and giving prophetic word to Rebekah, saying that these two sons are going to be two nations. Uh, he's already recognizing them long before they're born as being distinct. And so there are a number of these types of passages that we see in the Old Testament. For example, Jeremiah 1.5, the text reads, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you, according to the New American Standard uh, uh, translation. And so you have these types of passages appearing that are clearly pointing to the fact that God knows children in the womb before they are born. Now, Many were called uh, in, in the biblical text. Again, we see many of these types of texts that where we see Jacob and Esau, as noted, Jeremiah, John the Baptist, uh, and even Christ while he was still in the womb. We're going to look at that, you know, and how the interaction between him and John the Baptist as they were in utero. Uh, but the, there are a number of these types of passages. The psalmist speaks of this as well. And so uh, those who suggest that these verses do not apply uh, to the you know kind of to, to everyone that these are just specific examples of people who are called for special roles in ministry or whatnot but that it doesn't apply to everyone I think that that is a very misinformed perspective because what it's doing is it's saying well some are called and some are not uh, and what we see in the biblical text is very consistent what we see is the fact that all are called and that God treats people equally in this regard. And so we're all held accountable before God. And so uh, in the womb, I believe it's the same thing. We are all special to God, not just those who are called to a specific uh, purpose, but that all have, have a special place in God's eyes. 
And so uh, I go over to the New Testament and I look at, you know, what happened with John the Baptist, for example, when he recognized Jesus. Uh, this is when he was in utero, he was actually filled with the Holy Spirit while he was still in, in his mother's womb. Uh, and so, again, people need to keep in mind that these stories are just not myths, that they're actually recording how God views uh, children in the womb. Now, uh, as I noted when we were looking at the Rebecca uh, account in, in that chapter 25 of Genesis, you have Jacob and Esau, uh, long before they're born, uh, God has basically set out before you know the the audience, the Israelite audience, what these two peoples would be. You know, Edom would come out of Esau, and Israel would come out of Jacob, and so this is setting up an entire two people groups, and that's already being established in the womb. Um, and again, there, there are a number of arguments that have come, been pushed against this. In, in, my, in my book, I actually talk about uh, a couple scholars in particular. I kind of follow their arguments through and, and try to debunk them. But uh, some will say, well, if you believe this, then you believe in the pre-existence of soul, souls. And this was an ancient heresy uh, way back in, in the second century from Origen. Well, I think this is called, often called special pleading, what we call special pleading. Um, you don't have to believe in the pre-existent souls of souls to actually uh, believe that God sees the, uh, the children in the womb. What this is actually showing is that God has foreknowledge um, and that, that uh, pre-born children actually do in fact have souls. It isn't something that happens with their first breath when they come out of the womb. Uh, this is something that actually is long before that. And so just because there are a few texts, and that's one of the other arguments, well, there's only a few of these, and so therefore we can't make a whole doctrine on just a few of these texts. Well, that's a fallacy as well. Frequency does not determine uh, the importance of a text. If God says once, thou shalt not kill, it's still thou shalt not kill. It doesn't have to mention it a dozen times. In the same way, if God says that children in the womb are important, uh, even if he says it once, it is important. And so therefore, frequency, which is, a, 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 like I said, a poor argument that's often made. Well, if we don't see it, and we see the same type of argument being made for homosexuality, you know, well, it's not talked about much in the Bible, so therefore it's not important. It doesn't matter. If it's mentioned once and it has that type of importance, God places importance on it, then we need to take note of it. Now, I want to jump over out of Genesis just for a few minutes, and I want to look at the book of Exodus. Now, there's one probably of the dominant passages that deal with a child in utero. It's found in Exodus 21, verses 22 to 25. Uh, this is the famous text uh, where you have a, a woman being struck by a man or somebody strikes a pregnant woman, and the, the woman gives birth. And the, the text is, is not really clear, as clear as it could be, and so some people argue, well, because of the ambiguity, we can't use this text. Uh, and one of the portions of the ambiguity is if harm should follow, the text says, then the death penalty should ensue to the person who did the striking. Well, the question is who dies? Is it the mother or is it the child? And again, there is some, some debate on what's going on there. Um, the other question is, is it an accidental strike or is it malicious? Because this makes a difference. If it is accidental, and God still requires the death penalty, then this is setting precedent in, in Hebrew Torah. Uh, if it is malicious, then this would come under the guise of, or under the law of murder. But if it was an accident, normally this would be manslaughter and the person wouldn't die. And so these are the types of questions that are, are asked of this particular text. And because of the ambiguity that is often argued with this text, a lot of people set it aside and say, well, we can't use it for the abortion discussion. Well, I, I'm not of that persuasion. I look at this text and I say, there's enough there to tell us that God sees something very important about these preborn children that are in this situation. And the Greek term that's used there for a woman given birth is not the normal term that's normally used for a child when, when they are born. It is actually a term that is used, and, and the term is yatsa, which means to come out. Now, if this is a what is often known as a miscarriage, now there is a term for that. And so the author could have easily used the term nephel, and that means for the child to fall out of the womb. In other words, to, the child dies in utero and then falls out of the womb as a natural or spontaneous uh, abortion. Uh, the other term that is often used is shakal, and that term is used to be 
to kind of the idea of to be bereaved of children. And so in other words, the child dies and therefore is miscarried and the mother and the father are bereaved of their child. Those are the two terms that are normally used, but that's not what's used here in Exodus 21. The term that is used is this yatsah. And so what the author seems to be presenting is that this is not a regular birth. It is not a miscarriage. It is actually a child that is forced out of the womb by the kind of the, the, the blow that is struck onto the woman's abdomen or onto the womb. And so therefore it is clear that there is a birth that takes place, but it is not a normal birth. This is a forced birth. And so if the child lives, then there is not a death penalty assigned. But if the mother or the child, and I think that's why there, there is more ambiguity there. If the, fa if the child or the mother dies, in other words, any harm comes, then the, the man or the person who struck the woman forfeits their life. And so this uh, very clearly, I think, within the Hebrew text, points to the idea that this is not a regular birth. And so if it is not a regular birth, if it is in fact a premature birth, then that is telling us that the Hebrew Torah had a very a high view of that child in utero. And so once again, I think that this is not maybe, although not the clearest, it is definitely one of those other strands that helps us under, understand what is God's perspective of the unborn. So we move over to another passage in the Torah, and that is found in Numbers chapter 5, verses 11 to 31. It's a, a little bit of an extended narrative, but the narrative is speaking about a woman who is suspected by her husband as being taken in adultery. And so there was a whole procedure that they could follow. They would take, the, the husband would take the woman to the tabernacle and there the priest would take some dust off the floor of the tabernacle, mix it with some water and force the woman or the woman was told to drink it. Now, we often would immediately think, well, that's gross. Well, this was a trial of ordeal. And so what would happen is if in fact she was guilty, then there would be a curse that would come upon her. And this is where the, the, the debate begins. Uh, is this God forcing some type of a spontaneous abortion? In other words, that God is supporting abortion in this case. Well, here's the problem with that. We have no indication that the woman is pregnant. This is a question of her fidelity. And so what is going on here, and we find these types of curses in the ancient Near East, and part of my dissertation was to focus on these types of curses. And this sounds very similar to ancient curses that were delivered for a variety of reasons. And where people would, would give discharges of bloody ooze or, you know, just, you know, whether it be from, from the, the, their hinder parts or from their urinary tract, it was one of those things that was to show that the gods were against them. And so it just makes sense that if you ingest something, this is not necessarily going to cause an abortion as much as it would cause perhaps a urinary tract infection or some type of uh, poisoning there or some type of a, a diuretic that would cause a bloody discharge. In other words, proving that God was in the midst of this, showing that the woman was guilty. And the, and the term there that is used, that she will have a quote-unquote falling thigh. And, and scholars say, well, there it is. You know, that's the spontaneous abortion. Uh, well, here's the problem. It's the use of that language of the falling thigh. What does that mean? Normally, when this is speaking of, of someone's uh, uh, private parts, it would talk about, you know, placing a hand under the thigh. It's often in Genesis used that way to take an oath, uh, to take someone by the private parts and to swear an oath on their progeny. But this is not what's going on here. And so this idea of falling a falling thigh, it just seems like a discharging th thigh of some sort. In other words, that they're probably their posterior or their urinary tract is discharging something that is proving that um, they are guilty of what they are being charged of. Um, and the, the important point in this is this is not to support a doctor, you know, led abortion. This was God doing it. This was not man doing it. And God is overseeing this. Um, and so no matter how you look at it, this is not a text that should ever be used in support of abortion, uh, even though some have tried to do that. And so again, you got to keep in mind that, that even though this text is ambiguous, um, I think that at, at best it should be read more as a curse as opposed to uh, something that is promoting abortion. Now, the, the last few that I want to look at, um, some of them are, are, are again more stronger than others and some are not so much so. But one that is often quoted, and I've seen this quoted, is Ecclesiastes chapter 6, verses 3 to 5. 
Uh, this is the author Koheleth, who, who is the, the author of Ecclesiastes. He makes this note in, in chapter 6, verses 3 to 5, that those who do not enjoy the good gifts that God gives them in this lifetime are no better than a miscarried child. And so therefore scholars say, well, you see, you know, there's not a lot of importance placed on the miscarried child, uh, not important at all. Well, my argument would be this. Just because it is not uh, uh, noted specifically about the unborn child, but it's speaking more of a miscarriage, does not mean that God does not care for the unborn child. We have to be careful when we look at these types of texts. Um, what the author of Ecclesiastes is actually doing, and I've written an, uh, an, an entire book just on the Koheleth and the book of Ecclesiastes. What he's actually doing, he's saying, look, the person who doesn't enjoy the good gifts of life in this world are no better than the miscarried child. In other words, the child that is dead in the womb because both are dead. One is dead to its environment in the womb and the other one is dead to the life that God has given him. That's what the author is trying to do there. It is poetic in what he's trying to get across. And so again, we have to be careful with those types of texts. Now, the one text that I think is probably the clearest and it doesn't get attention is a text from Amos, Amos chapter 1, verse 13. I think it's one of the clearest examples. And I'm in the process of actually working on an article on this to flesh out this argument. But this is where we actually have the, the prophet Amos calling out the Ammonites in the Transjordan, who had a heinous practice in the ancient world of actually taking and going into the neighboring nations and ripping open pregnant women. In other words, stopping the procreative process and stopping them from expanding into their borders. And really, uh, this is probably some of the harshest critique that is given by God. And he said, because of this, because they have shed innocent blood and they have attacked the defenseless, God was actually going to take them and he was going to put some to the sword. In other words, he was going to kill some of them and others would go into exile. Because what the author of Amos is actually pointing out here, what the prophet is pointing out, is the fact that what we are seeing is somebody going directly against not just protecting the unprotected, but also against uh, the whole idea of procreation. And I think that is one of the clearest passages where God himself through the prophet is saying, those who do these type of heinous acts, who take and, 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 and not just attack the women, but attack their children in the womb, that they were going to be executed or sent into exile. I think that's one of the clearest places where we see God's protection of the unborn. Now, when you move over into the New Testament in the book of Luke, uh, Luke verses, uh, or chapter 1, verses 44 through 40, uh, 41 through 44, sorry, uh, this is the story, and I've noted it already in this discussion, where you have John the Baptist meeting for the first time Jesus. And the term that is used there in the Greek is the fact that when, they, when it speaks of Jesus as a child in the womb and John the Baptist, the term there is brephos. And that is a term for child, whether born or unborn. And, and we see this also in the, in the Old Testament. They don't speak of a child in the womb by some specific name. They actually use ben, which is this idea of a son or a child. And so that to me is kind of the key of understanding how the Bible is viewing um, the unborn. Now, just to kind of summarize these texts and, and what we have covered, the Bible is really has one voice. Uh, it's univocal on this. It values life, whether born uh, or pre-born. No matter what, what we are seeing is a consistent ethic uh, of life. Um, those causing an abortion are viewed as murders in the Bible. If you look at what we see in Amos chapter 1, if we look at Exodus 21, they are assigned, in some cases, the death penalty. So that was what was assigned for those who would murder. And so we need to take those to heart. Evangelicals arguing for you know, access to abortion on some level are simply wrong. The Bible is clear, even though they would say that it's, it's ambiguous when you look at the overall tenor of Scripture and those passages dealing with the unborn. I think that's very clear. Arguments suggestion, you know, ultimately suggesting that uh, we should neglect abor or forget about abortion because of the, the lack of clarity or the ambiguity, uh, again, should be, should be set aside. The left's rejection, for example, of ultrasound bills, this is what you know, it's kind of stepping to one side and going back to the cultural issue again. I find it telling when the left does everything in its power to try to stop a, you know, the, any type of ultrasound bills being passed. And those bills are where a woman, before she gets an abortion, must have an ultrasound. Why are they so scared of those types of laws? Well, I'll tell you, it's because the mother themselves see for themselves that that, that is actually a child moving 
breathing in her womb uh, and, and, and alive. And so I think that this is more telling than, than what most people want to actually point to. And so as I move forward in the last portion of this discussion, what I want to do is I want to look at what are some of the Christian arguments? In other words, uh, we have these texts, and some people have argued that we've actually got, you know, there's ambiguity there. And again, I think this is a, that's a, a, an unfortunate way of looking at the text. But there are a number of, of uh, uh, arguments that have been given. I want to just briefly look at those. And again, I go in more detail in the book. Um, I want to begin this portion by just noting, and I, I may have noted this before, but if, if two-thirds of the United States claim to be Christian, quote-unquote Christian, we could end the abortion issue in one election cycle if we wanted to. But there is no will, and that is because too many evangelicals and too many Christians are actually uh, pro-choice. And again, that is, that is anti-scriptural. We covered that last time. So there are four camps when it comes to the abortion debate within the church. And the first one is just complete ambivalence. They don't care. Uh, the second one are those who are militantly against it. Like there's no way this should ever be. The, then there are, of course, those who are for it. So you have the for and against, the ambivalent. And then you have those who say, okay, it's okay as long as it's rare or as long as you're, the parents can agree in prayer that they should get an abortion. And they have a peace about it. That last argument is just troubling on its face. But um, I want to work through some of the arguments that are used by these different camps. And the first one I want to look at, and again, these are the ones who are you know, the, more the pro-choice. Um, they say, well, we can't impose our morality on anybody else. And so to do that, you know, that would be unchristian. Well, my response to that would be then, so whose morality should we follow? If we can impose morality on people, whose morality should we? Should it be the enemies? Should it be the lefts? Should it be the world's? We have no problem imposing biblical morality on people all the time. When it comes to rape, murder, bestiality, all of these things are actually from the Bible. And there's a reason why we have these laws. In other words, that is a very weak argument about the imposing morality. We do this all the time and we should impose mora our morality on, on people, especially if it's scriptural and it's coming from God's mandates. One of the other ones is the ambiguity argument. And again, I have been talking about the first half of this discussion is all about that. And again, they say the Bible is unclear on it. Well, as I've noted, um, my response to that is very easy. Um, there are a lot of heinous things. Even if we you know, set aside the biblical text, there are a lot of things that the Bible doesn't cover but that we just know that are morally wrong. The Bible doesn't say that we should, for example, put people in gas chambers. But I'll tell you, we don't do it. Why? Because it is morally wrong. In the same way, we shouldn't be killing the unborn, even though the Bible, you may say, is ambiguous on it, which I don't think it is. But we shouldn't be doing it because it is just morally wrong. Um, there's simply too much evidence that pushes against that type of argument. One of the other arguments that is given is this, it's just another sin and God will forgive me, you know, and so therefore, you know, it's no, it's no worse than lying or cheating or, you know, gluttony or whatever. Uh, this is where I push back against this argument that all sin is equal. All sin is not equal. There are some sins that can lead a nation into destruction faster than anything else. Um, when you look at this, you say, well, Dr. Peterson, where are you getting this? Well, Christ himself actually made it very clear when he was speaking to Pilate. Uh, he, when Pilate was getting ready to sentence him to death, and Jesus said, you know, you don't have the worst sin. The one who has the worst sin is the one who gave me over to you, who delivered me over to you. In other words, uh, made it very clear that there was a level of sin. Or take, for example, those who had rejected the message of Christ in the New Testament. When Christ speaks about it, he says, it's going to be better off for Sodom and Gomorrah in the days of judgment than for these nations who have rejected Christ. What is that telling us? That there are, in fact, sins that are worse than others. And so we need to be careful uh, on how these arguments are made. And again, I touch more on this in the, in the, in the textbook. Uh, and uh, one of the, the key ones, and I think that stands out consistently um, in the biblical text, that stands out as far as a, a, more, a particularly heinous sin. And that is the whole idea of the shedding of innocent blood. Uh, when we look at what happened to Judah at the very end of their existence prior to going into exile in 586, you actually have the sins of Manasseh, the last of the kind of more of the evil, greatest of the evil kings of Judah. And the reason that Israel or Judah in particular went into, went into exile was because of the shedding of innocent blood. You can't tell me that America's shedding of innocent blood of the unborn is not going to go unpunished. And so 
We need to be careful with these types of arguments because Romans 6, 1, Paul makes very clear, clear, shall we sin so grace may abound or proliferate? Heaven forbid. And that's the same way I look at the abortion discussion in that regard. One of the other discussions I find even uh, as troubling, if not more so, is what is called the pro-life and social justice fallacies. Um, this is the, the basic discussion that these camps, and they're usually the left of center group, they use the fallacious mantra that uh, from the womb to the tomb, you know, we are, we are for, uh, you know, all life from the womb to the tomb. Well, what they're basically saying is we're basically for anybody who is um, on this side of the womb. In other words, that we can see those who are the, you know, the visibly oppressed. And so uh, it, it, is a, it is a fallacy when you, when you see this, uh, when the left is saying that they, they want justice. Well, where's the justice for the unborn? Uh, the, for the 62 million unborn, I've had this discussion with some of my own colleagues, and I say, I'll tell you, the last time I checked, there wasn't 62 million people at the border and 62 million people dying of hunger in the United States of America, I'm speaking. But I'm telling you, we've killed over 62 million babies. And if that is not something to be concerned about as a social justice issue, then we better start again and start this discussion. And so just want to look at some of these arguments, or so, again, some of the responses to that, this particular, particular argument. The social justice arguments are, are based upon the, the, the prophets a lot of times. They will say, well, the prophets were all about protecting those who are unprotected. You know, the widow, the poor, and the orphan, and the alien or the foreigner. And I'm like, I'm all for that. Praise God. But you have totally misunderstood what the prophets were speaking about. Because I tell you, if the prophets were alive today, they may include that other, those, th those three groups, but they would be standing screaming for the unborn. Because what they were doing in the Old Testament is they were pointing to groups of people who did not have protection under the law. In other words, the widow, the poor, the orphan, the alien, the foreigner didn't have protections under most law. And that's why the Hebrew law made sure that they were protected. But we've had actual discussions from presidential candidates saying that the Constitution does not protect uh, the unborn. And that is who the prophets would be speaking about today. And yes, like I said, there are lots of laws on the book protecting laws on the books protecting the widow, the poor, the orphan, and the and the foreigner. I am an Eddie Alien, so to speak. I am a, a a naturalized citizen that came here from another country. I recognize that you can't kill me without repercussion. But guess what? You can kill babies in the womb, and they're the ones who are unprotected. So the prophets would have been standing for them. One of the other issues is that they fail to distinguish between the, the role of the believer and the role of the state. And they say, well, we can't do anything about this. Um, that's up to the state. Or that we as the church need to do more and we need to force the state to do more. Well, I'll tell you, th there's nothing prohibiting the church or the individual to, from going and helping the widow, the poor, and the orphan. Uh, but the state has other uh, things to take care of. They have, you know, they have borders to protect. They have laws to enact that are protecting all of the population. And so, uh, this argument that the 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 state has to do everything is is really a poor argument when it comes to this social justice fallacy. Um, one of the other issues that I have is the fact that God is a God of order, and and when people are going for the social justice uh, concept and from the womb to the tomb argument. But yet they turn a blind eye to the chaos that a lot of these social justice movements are, you know, are, are putting forward. Uh, what they are doing, I think, is going on the opposite side. Because God is a God of order. We see it in Genesis. We see it throughout his word that God is a God of order. And therefore, anything that's chaotic, be it BLM and Antifa and all of this stuff, what happened to the days of the, of the, the quiet protests and the peaceful protests of Martin Luther King Jr., uh, who tried to present that, that Christian perspective? So again, that, that is a very poor argument. Uh, those in this camp often, uh, in the, on the left, continue to elect liberal side, you know, liberal perspective people. And guess what that does? It doesn't help our issues. It actually proliferates it because they elect or pass legislation that only makes abortion more um, prevalent and even at a later date in the in the pregnancy. Uh, Christians can be known. One of the other arguments is, well, we don't want to be known for what we are against. We want to be known for what we are for. That's just a, a sad argument. It's not an either or. It can, be, it can be a both and. All you have to do is look at Jesus. Look at the prophets. They were known for what they were for, and they were known for what they were against. 
and this argument that we need to be, you know, supportive of, of everything because we can't be, you know, going against everybody. They'll, they won't like us. Well, guess what? They didn't like Jesus. Jesus said they didn't like me and they're not going to like you. The prophets weren't liked. And I'll tell you, standing up for what is right is not going to win you any favor amongst the world. And so very poor argument that, that, that is often given from that perspective. The Christian left also rejects um, and marginalize anyone who does not see it from their perspective. In other words, they attack conservative Christians all the time. And some of the stuff that I have read, it is so polemical and it is so uh, over the top and in some cases downright racist against those who do not agree with them. And I'm saying, well, that's certainly not Christian. And I'm just, you need to keep in mind that when you start listening to these arguments, what's the spirit behind them? Uh, some of the other arguments is that we see are the premise that those on the right are focused only on the one issue. They're just, all th everything is about abortion. They forget about everything else. Well, no, that's not necessarily true either. I care for a lot of what's going on. I want to see justice in the world. But I'll tell you, there is one issue that is standing out and is screaming at us as a nation. And that is, what are we going to do with the unborn? And how are we going to treat them? And again, this goes back to the argument of the prophets and how they would have looked at this. And so this whole perspective that you, you know, you, you just got to you know, look at all of the things. Well, I'll tell you, how we got rid of slavery, how we got the civil rights issue is we focused on one issue. And we zeroed in on it as a church concertedly. And that's how they, those heinous acts got uh, removed from our society. And so guess what? It's when the church comes together, we focus with one accord on this issue. This is when it's going to get done. Now, as I, as I bring this to a close, I just want to look at a couple last arguments. And, and some of them people argue that uh, we need to have abortion for cases of rape and incest and those types of things. Well, I'll tell you, that, that is a poor, poor argument. I, I already have an issue with you know, following one heinous act with another one. That's already a problem on its own, but that's for another discussion. But I'll tell you, when it comes to the issue of uh, rape and incest, that is a red herring argument. We already had laws on the book long before Ro Roe v. Wade that protected women in those cases if, if that was the route they went. So this was just a red herring to be able to open up the whole uh, uh, abortion issue for uh, abortion on demand. That's what that was about. And just so you know, the, the, the percentage of those who fall into this category are less than 1%. It is minuscule compared to the number of abortions that are just from abortion on demand. And so very poor argument. Uh, finally, when people use that language of social justice instead of abortion, it's really what they're doing is they're sanitizing this. They're trying to muddy the water by just kind of glossing it over, and there's nothing to see here, folks. But I'll tell you, I, I, in the last two lessons, I have tried to pull back the curtain. And this is not something that is easy to discuss, but I'll tell you, abortion for what it is, it is heinous, it is murder. And for those who, who support those who are passing legislation for it, uh, ultimately they will be held accountable, accountable before God. And so as I conclude this chapter, I just want to go back and, and reiterate a couple points. And that is this. The Bible is very clear that it condemns anybody taking life, whether it is in the womb or outside of the womb. You cannot make that discussion or make that argument, sorry, that everything is perfectly fine. And Christians who are supporting pro-choice politicians and because they like their other policies, I tell you, will be held accountable. Whether in this life or the next, they will be held accountable because they are the ones who are proliferating this through the heinous legislation that is being passed. Abortion is the civil rights issue of our day. And until we as a church come together and we form a unified alliance and we say enough, it is not going to stop. And that's what stopped slavery. And that's what stopped the civil rights issues and the, the oppression of, of our African-American brothers and sisters. It was when the church said enough. And it's going to, be, it's going to take that as well for us today. It is our responsibility, ultimately, it's our responsibility to teach our children and teach the next generation the moral bankruptcy of abortion and those who advocate for it. And so as we move forward, we're going to look at some other very difficult issues. But I'll tell you, this is the one thing for me, having five children of my own and watching every one of those births. No one can say that God is not there in the midst and that the procreation is not a central part of what God has given as a mandate for humanity. Until next time. I pray that you continue reading on, and we will see you on the next session.